Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. This afternoon, we'll be focusing on a recent book by Brandon Byrd entitled The Black Republic, African Americans and the Fate of Haiti, published earlier this year by the University of Pennsylvania Press. I'm Eric Arneson from the George Washington University, co-chair of the Washington History Seminar. The seminar is a collaborative venture of the Woodrow Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program and the American Historical Association's National History Center. And for over the past decade, the seminar has been meeting weekly, usually is on Monday, in pre-COVID times, in person at the Wilson Center, and since pandemic restrictions, in the virtual realm. Today's session is being co-sponsored by the Amahundro Institute of Early American History and Culture, and I am delighted to once again be sharing the co-chairing role with the director of the Amahundro Institute, Karen Wolf of the College of William and Mary. Behind the scenes, there are a couple of people who make these seminars possible, Pete Bierstecker of the Wilson Center and Rachel Wheatley of the National History Center. And I'd like to thank two institutional supporters, the LePage Center for History and the Public Interest and the George Washington University Department of History, as well as a number of anonymous individual donors. On the logistics front, you should know today's session is being recorded and can soon be found on our institution's respective websites. And when we get to the question and answer session, section, we ask that those with questions use the raise hand function uh, or the Q&A function on Zoom. Those watching on Facebook Live, you can email your questions to Rachel Wheatley, whose email address is posted in the chat function. We'll call on as many folks as we can. And now, with that business out of the way, let me turn over the Zoom screen to Karen Wolf, who will be moderating today's session. Karen, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, on behalf of the Omohundro Institute, we're delighted to be partnering to bring more early American history, the platform for our nation, to this important audience. And today, we're looking a little later chronologically, but to an essential context for early America, the history of Haiti, a nation founded in resistance to slavery and colonialism, and the first nation to permanently ban slavery. It's a real pleasure to introduce the scholar whose work we're focused on today, I'm really delighted to have Brandon here. Professor Byrd teaches in the history department at Vanderbilt University. He earned his PhD at the University of North Carolina in 2014. He is a historian of black intellectual and social history with special focus on black internationalism. This afternoon, we're going to be talking about his first book, as Eric mentioned, The Black Republic, African-Americans and the Fate of Haiti. His writing has appeared in scholarly and public outlets, including the Journal of African American History, Slavery and Abolition, and the Journal of Haitian Studies, and in popular outlets such as the Washington Post. He was a faculty fellow at Vanderbilt's Robert Penn Warren Center in 2019-20, and he is on leave this year working on several book projects. One is Prophets, Vagabonds, and Princes, Intellectual Histories After Emancipation, which aims to chart a new intellectual history of the post-emancipation Americas. The second, The Hollies, A History of the Atlantic World, covers three generations of a single family as they moved around the 19th and 20th century United States, Caribbean, Europe, and Africa. Welcome, Brandon. Karen, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you to everybody at uh, the Wilson Center, the National History Center, uh, just for having me here today uh, for such a wonderful event. Uh, you know, it's really a pleasure. Uh, anytime I get to talk about my work, uh, the folks engage with it, uh, but certainly in this forum. Uh, so, you know, I know that this is a really dynamic uh, part of why I'm so excited about this is such a dynamic format. So I don't want to take up uh, too much time at the outset, uh, and especially, uh, you know, the, the other person I really want to make sure that I thank is uh, Professor uh, Professor Dubois, who's uh, taking the time out of out of his busy schedule uh, to be in conversation. So uh, uh, again, I'm, I'm going to be brief here at the outset. Um, and really, what I uh, just want to do is sort of uh, talk a bit about how I came uh, to this book project, uh, talk a little bit about, uh, you know, so some of the things I tried to do in terms of uh, intervention, argumentation, talk through some sources, and uh, think through a little bit uh, about the, uh, the saliency uh, that I at least see in, in the work and even some of the political commitments that uh, 
uh, sort of animated me as I was writing it and uh, that I still am thinking through and processing even, even in the aftermath of writing it. Uh, so with that, let, let me just jump in, right? Uh, so this book really traces back uh, actually to uh, uh, the time before uh, I really even uh, sort of envisioned a, uh, a career in history. Uh, I actually dates back to uh, uh, my undergraduate career when I was uh, preparing to write an honors thesis at Davidson College. And uh, as a native North Carolinian and as somebody that, uh, uh, wanted to have some um, close contact with archives that I knew I'd have uh, relatively easy access to. Uh, I chose as my subject for that thesis, uh, a man named Charles Clinton Spaulding, uh, C.C. Spaulding, as he was better known. C.C. Uh, Spaulding was uh, one of the most uh, influential, prominent Black businessmen in uh, really in uh, North Carolina's history. Uh, that his sort of claim to fame would be that uh, he was the president of the North Carolina uh, Mutual Life Insurance Company um, for much of the, uh, basically the first five decades of the 20th century. And uh, the North Carolina Mutual is one of the largest uh, black life insurance companies uh, in the United States uh, for much of the 20th century. And again, so this was a, uh, this was a topic that I felt close to both, uh, you know, Spalding as having such a prominence to African-American history uh, in my native state uh, this one that I had close archives to, uh, close, I uh, had access to some archives that were close geographically, uh, both to my home uh, in Raleigh and also to uh, my college in Davidson. You know, so again, it was really close to home, both in a sort of metaphorical and also a very real uh, material sense. Uh, now, uh, it, it was a little bit of a surprise then when in the archives I kept coming, in his archives were at Duke, uh, kept coming across uh, these documents uh, and sources about this trip that Spalding took to Haiti in 1937. Uh, so right after uh, the first U.S. occupation of Haiti uh, had ended. And, uh, you know, so that was surprising at the time. And also the language uh, that he talked about the trip sort of had a resonance. Uh, and he talked about it as an attempt to throw up a highway between the Negroes in North Carolina and those in Haiti, right? Uh, and of course, to throw up a highway, you know, this is very much a uh, metaphorical language, right? It meant to uh, conjure images of cooperation between African-Americans and Haitians. Uh, you know, for Spalding, the idea was that uh, this would be a way to form, you know, some, some real bilateral relations uh, between really a, a sort of business elite in Haiti and uh, the business interests that he represented. Um, but, Beyond that sort of, you know, very clear uh, metaphorical use of that language, um, you know, there, there were some uh, uh, some ways in which that language also like sparked some things, you know, in, in my imagination, right? Uh, to throw up a highway was language that uh, in some ways conjured, you know, sort of images of the Durham Freeway, the freeway that would raise right through uh, the historic Black residential and business districts. Uh, uh, in Durham, uh, which uh, coincidentally uh, were called Hey Tai, uh, right? That's how locals pronounce it. But of course, it's spelled uh, after the 19th century spelling of Haiti, the nation state, right? Uh, and that name of uh, that Black business district in Durham dates back to the Reconstruction era. So it's very much, and there's some debate about how the name comes about, uh, but for Black Durhamites, it very much is an honorific. Um, you know, so that that's that sparked something there, right? So you know, the questions that emerge are the questions that you would sort of uh, that you would expect. You know, what are these connections between uh, Haiti and Haiti? What are these connections between uh, uh, both you know historical memory among African Americans, the uh, even the politics that are captured in that naming practice? Uh, and sort of the ongoing struggles of the Haitian nation, nation state for, for sovereignty. Uh, you know, and how do these things date, date back, not just to that moment in 1937 where I was accounting, uh, encountering, uh, you know, these attempts to throw up a highway, but also in, you know, even the formative years of Spalding's life, right, in the late 19th century, right? Uh, so these are all questions that I was really trying to pursue. Uh, well, 
at the time I ended up uh, going forth with an honors thesis that was really about Spalding's work with the mutual, but the questions lingered. And that's ultimately when I ended up pursuing at, uh, at in, in my PhD program at UNC and uh, you know, what I've uh, tried to capture a bit in this book, these questions really about how did Haiti matter? Why did it matter to African-Americans in the late 19th, early 20th century? Uh, so with that, let me uh, talk a little bit about some, uh, you know, some initial findings or uh, the, the findings that ultimately found their way into this book, right? Uh, so from these initial questions, uh, you know, as, you know, any historian would do, you know, the, the next process sort of entailed uh, thinking about uh, what the scholarship uh, told me what it told us and what uh, you know, I can contribute to this on, to this conversation, which is very much an ongoing one uh, in a very dynamic and robust one, right? Uh, so in many ways, this, this story that, that we find in a number of uh, really uh, excellent books, uh, books and articles now, uh, is a story about 19th century African-Americans uh, and the Haitian Revolution primarily. Uh, this is a story in which the Haitian Revolution uh, absolutely galvanizes enslaved people, uh, which it influences Black Northerners. Uh, it encourages Black Northerners to celebrate Haiti as an example of Black independence, racial equality, uh, to identify Haiti even as a potential homeland uh, during the antebellum period, during the years before uh, the US Civil War. Uh, in many respects, this is a history uh, I think is most, uh, commonly interpreted uh, that uh, sometimes uh, may, bleed, uh, may bleed a bit into uh, narratives about the 20th century, uh, narratives about black playwrights like uh, Jacob Lawrence, for example, uh, not playwrights, artists, playwrights, musicians, and others uh, uh, who then include Jacob Lawrence, right? Uh, who would produce uh, just a wealth of artistic reproductions in which uh, Toussaint Louverture and the Haitian Revolution are claimed as part of an African-American heritage. Uh, in many respects, this is a story about racial unity, a story about liberation, a story in which historical memory, again, takes pride of place. It's a story about cultural pride. Uh, but this is a body of scholarship uh, that also, uh, it's not an uncomplicated one. It's a, it's a, it's a body of scholarship that, uh, uh, that that really encourages some uh, some real thinking about uh, black pol political thought and some of the nuances there. Uh, so the work of scholars, so put simply, the work of scholars dating back to folks like Rayford Logan, more recently Leslie Alexander, Matthew Clavin, Gerald Horn, certainly Brenda Gale Plummer, Millery Polinay, Julius Scott, Michael West. I could go on. I'll stop there. Uh, these are scholars uh, who, again, I attempted to engage in a conversation that I saw ongoing in their works, right? Uh, and this is a conversation in which uh, it's very clear that African-American protagonists understood that Haitian history did not end in 1804, even if they celebrated the Haitian Revolution. This is a body of scholarship that tells us that African-Americans were very much concerned with Haiti's present that they were very much concerned with Haiti's future, that they were in, engaged in conversation with uh, Haitians, uh, that put simply, they were not just interested in its revolutionary past. Uh, and so this body of scholarship, uh, you know, in teaching all these things informed how I then looked, uh, not just to that, again, the era of early US national history or to an antebellum history, but informed then the, how, uh, I would try to look at the late 19th and early 20th century, right? Um, how I would look at what turned out to be just a, a wealth of references, uh, not just to the Haitian Revolution, but to Haiti in periodicals, plays, art, speeches, correspondence, autobiographies, missionary records, uh, just a voluminous amount of, uh, of sources from this period. Right, references to Haiti pervaded, it turned out, the records of black political, religious, educational organizations, institutions. Uh, and these sources, very, they, they clearly show that Haiti mattered uh, to many African-Americans, again, uh, because of its, uh, not just its past revolution, right, or a revolution that was past, I guess is another way to put it, but because of its ongoing revolutionary challenges 
to the world made by European imperial expansion. That it mattered because Haiti was also a major target of mounting US imperial aggression. That it mattered because it was a constant object of racist discourses. That it mattered because it was a critical site of US black diplomacy. It mattered because it was even a persistent attraction for perspective, even if not realized, African-American immigrants. Uh, and it mattered uh, not as part of a single story, is something that I also want to emphasize uh, here. Um, that uh, all of this engagement, uh, uh, it raised a, a number of questions, right? Uh, it raised questions about how did African-Americans understand uh, Haiti's abstract and historical symbolism in an international order dominated by imperial nation states, including the United States. Um, these sources all raise questions like, what did it mean for African-Americans to defend Haiti as modern or civilized or to champion even a black republic? Uh, it raised questions like, how did solidarity manifest itself materially and discursively? What were the deeper aspirations and anxieties projected onto and produced from thinking about Haiti? Uh, and so these are really the questions that uh, I endeavored to try to, to try to answer in the Black Republic. And uh, just briefly and in conclusion here, um, you know, because again, I want to uh, be respectful of, uh, of our time. Uh, in trying to answer these questions and really in exploring uh, the major themes in the Black Republic, major themes like race, nation, freedom, self-determination. Uh, what I really tried to do uh, was reflect on the uses, promises, and challenges of Black internationalism. Uh, my goal uh, in the book was to, to really try to approach internationalism as a process, uh, to try to understand the outcomes of African Americans' concern with the fate of Haiti, you know, the title. Uh, for a number of African Americans, I think, their thinking about their relationship with Haiti uh, at times reinforced ideas about US and African-American exceptionalism and strengthened their insistence on inclusion in US civil and political life. Uh, for others, and I think the most profound lessons for me <clears throat> uh, are this, I think for others, Haiti's placement in the crosshairs of a burgeoning US empire helped them develop sharper critiques of the US and create radical political solidarities not just with the Haitian nation state, but with the Haitian people themselves, with the Haitian people themselves. A wide swath of African-Americans uh, <clears throat> would even contemplate what Haiti's embattled standing and Haitian people's embattled standing in the international community revealed about their own condition and broader than that, what Haitian independence and the independence of the sovereign people of Haiti would mean for the colored world and for oppressed people worldwide. So, and I will, I will end there and uh, uh, look forward to uh, the continuance of our round table and our discussion here. Thank you so much, Brandon. Um, I wanna say too, something uh, that occurs to me every time I look at this book, which is that it's an absolutely beautiful object. The cover of it is utterly gorgeous. If anyone, the gorgeous Jacob Lawrence print is stunning. So. Anyway, you should all um, buy the book. Um, so I want to introduce our respondent today. Uh, very, very brief uh, introduction here for uh, Laurent Dubois. Um, Professor Dubois teaches history at the University of Virginia, where he is also the co-director of academic affairs for the university's democracy initiative. He is the author or editor of more than a dozen books, primarily about the history of the Caribbean in the era of slavery, but also about the history and culture of sports, especially soccer and music, especially the banjo. His first book, which won the 2005 Frederick Douglass Book Prize and three other awards is A Colony of Citizens, Revolution and Slave Emancipation in the French Caribbean. And I have to mention it because it was published by the Omohundro Institute with our partner UNC Press. And his latest book is co-authored with my William and Mary colleague, Richard Turritz, called Freedom Roots, Histories from the Caribbean. Laurent. Well, thank you so much uh, for having in, invited me for this. It's just such a pleasure to talk about such a, an incredible book. Um, and so I'm just gonna uh, raise a couple thoughts and questions and responses, uh, and then we'll move to move into our discussion. Um, first of all, Brandon, I just wanna compliment you on such an achievement. It's a beautifully written book, um, really engaging, so complex in its engagement with all the layers. Um, also a deeply empathetic book, I think, uh, one that really takes seriously 
these thinkers and these, you know, these, the way that they struggled with a lot of different questions. And, and I find that that's sometimes a little hard to come by, I think. And I think that's, that's really important in this work. Um, obviously it's part, it's, it's part of a tradition um, that, that kind of creates um, a sense of the deep imbrications, the deep connections between Haiti and the United States. The fact that these are two nations that, you know, were, were born the first two independent nations, of course, in the Americas, the way that the expansion and change in the United States was connected to Haiti um, through the Louisiana Purchase and then into the 19th century. And you really deepen our sense of these, of these tight and complex interconnections in the 18th century, I mean, sorry, in the 19th century. Um, one of the things I think it does is to give us a sense is, of the genealogies, right? As I was reading the book, one realizes the, the depth and complexities of dealing with Haiti and all of the layers of it, right? That there's, there's always a kind of, um, an, an, an idea of Haiti um, that intersects with the reality of Haiti, but not fully, right? There's this kind of, and there's, there's in a way, and I, I do think this, this might be an extreme statement, but I think it's maybe true that there may be no country on the planet that has had more projected onto it from outside than Haiti, right? The way in which this country has um, served so many different agendas uh, as an idea, right? From pro-slavery and anti-slavery agendas to kind of ideas of race, to ideas of liberation. Um, and it, it's interesting, of course, we're part of that tradition, right? And you're part of that tradition and engaged in that thinking. Um, and I'll, I'll turn to that in just a moment about the moment we're in right now. Um, but I think that's a very important part of this as well. Um, but it also raises this question about the, the, the fact that for so often, so often the question is like, what's wrong with Haiti, right? Um, and then the response is sort of like, what's right with Haiti, or as if there's a kind of perpetual debate. And of course, what becomes difficult is a kind of just Haiti as fully Haiti, right? In all its complexities, like any other nation, right? The, to just the struggle to give Haiti or to afford Haiti the opportunity to be fully complex in all its dimensions um, is hard sometimes, just given what's projected onto it. And, and what you illustrate so powerfully in the book, which is that people in the United States, African-Americans feeling like the way that Haiti is seen fundamentally affects them, right? And, and how, how implicated Haiti is in some ways in their own well-being and the way in which that kind of allows for a projection onto Haiti as well. Um, one thing that fascinated me, and, and it's something, you know, we've discussed uh, and over the years, and I think is, it is, you know, part of, at the core of so much of what the discomfort, sometimes that's at least certain of the characters that you describe um, have when they enter into the Haitian context is this engagement with Haitian agriculture, right? With the way the land is used, right? In particular, um, and in, notably, for instance, the fact of market women, the, 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 the powerful presence of these market women who kind of control these marketplaces. Um, so I think all of that, I think is a really interesting point. Um, and I was struck by it's, the reason I think about it is that I also think that this is a struggle that's going on within African American debates within the United States, right? You know, of course, Jean Casimir's work, who argues that Haiti is structured by a kind of counter plantation system, uh, an, an access to land, a creation of new forms of family, a whole set of systems that are meant to kind of leave slavery behind and create a new structure. And of course, we see that too in the United States, right? There's all these aspects of African American life that are also basically a counter plantation system that's emerging, but that is often at odds with what, what certain elites or certain urban sectors are seeing. So there's a way in which I often feel like people are talking about Haitian rural culture, but they're also actually talking about Southern black rural culture. And I think it'd be, it'd be great to sort of explore that more. Um, I'm so excited to hear your, your writing about the Holly family, which I just think is such a fascinating story. So just, just great that you're, you're taking that on. I think it really needs to be told. But I was thinking as I was reading too about um, Rayford Logan, you know, who is a Howard professor who wrote this book in 41 on Haiti, Haiti in the United States, um, in part because you mentioned how he's sort of implicated in his moment, right, as a scholar, but also as an activist. And I know that you know you also I think has, have someone in the African American Intellectual History Society and your work have taken this this role of speaking to larger publics and affecting the the, the discussion. Um, so I, again, I think that's it, it's great to see you doing that to kind of drawing on these stories, but thinking about these different audiences and thinking carefully about what role a historian has in society today. Um, and it's it's striking that we're at another moment, right? Where kind of Haiti and the United States are once again interconnected. Where U.S. has a huge impact on what's unfolding in Haiti. Where the some a lot of the same problems about Haitian, the Haitian state and and political leadership, are unfolding. Um, and I think 
one of the things I would love for, you know, when we think about contemporary policy is that so much contemporary policy doesn't take a holistic approach to Haiti, doesn't understand the depth of the connections. Um, and what we need is a way of thinking about Haiti that understands how tightly the Haiti and the US have been intertwined in all these ways. And so I think the genealogy that you provide us there is, is really important for the history, but it's also extremely urgent and important for, for today's kind of discussions. So I'll end on that note and uh, thank you very much. Brenda, did you want to reply, respond to any of the issues that Laurent raised in particular, lineages of intellectual history, Haiti's resonances, many of mm. them? Did you want to respond to those before we go to some questions? Yeah, I mean, there, <laughs> there, there, there's so many points. Uh, I guess even before I try to speak to them. Uh, so uh, I know uh, Laurent is, uh, he's, he's too humble to, uh, uh, to mention this, but but I will. But a, a lot of this. Uh, so if there's any if there's any way in which uh, what I ended up writing was empathetic, which is some that's a, I, I love that word. That, that's something I strive to do. A lot of that uh, would have been shaped uh, by one of the the early seminars. It must it had to even have been my first or second uh, semester of graduate study was in uh, Lamont's uh, Haitian history seminar, uh, where that was that was an environment that I think was critical uh, to the the genesis to the formation of this work uh, because it was a space where uh, I could not come out of that and not appreciate uh, exactly what Laurent spoke to that uh, that even when you you are writing about the ideas of Haiti and the construction of Haiti as an idea that there has to be a real, uh, there has to be a, a sort of, uh, certainly a grappling, uh, appreciating the depth of the, the, the African-American political actors and, and thinkers uh, who are engaged in that process, but also a real understanding about the place that they are projecting these ideas on. Um, and so, uh, you know, and then my success in doing this may, uh, you know, uh, readers can let me know how successful <laughs> I was. Uh, but what I ultimately, uh, you know, tried to do was uh, to to grapple with the times in which, um, you know, as as Laurent, you know, puts it, like the ways in which those things did not always map onto each other uh, evenly, right? Um, and so, yeah, one of the ways in which, uh, yeah, so uh, the, the points about land and, uh, uh, even so land is so, uh, I think, how to put this, the one area where you see those like real sort of discrepancies are both in dealing with uh, Haiti's rural classes, but then also it's, it's urban, uh, many aspects of the urban environment as well. So on the one hand, uh, and you see this especially, uh, you know, I'm thinking like turn of the 20th century, especially uh, African American intellectuals, thinkers, and I'm using intellectual broadly speaking, who are very much, um, you know, sort of sold on the Tuskegee model as a means of uplift, uh, both in the U.S. and also broadly speaking diasporically and even on the African continent. Uh, and they're very real sort of uh, misgivings about some of uh, the ways that uh, some of the practices of, um, you know, attempts to uh, uh, sort of stave off an export-oriented plantation-based economy through small land holding, uh, through the cultivation of, uh, you know, uh, you know, small, you know, small plots of land where family may grow a little coffee, that type of thing. Uh, and just a real sort of, um, uh, inability to see that as a, a form of, uh, really nation-based development. I guess, and that's a bit anachronistic to put it in those terms, but I, I think y'all get what I'm saying. Um, and so I think that's one of the ways, but then on the same hand, uh, you know, the urban environment presents some challenges to this real sort of uh, aspirational idea of, of Haiti that uh, some African-Americans, especially, uh, you know, these bourgeois African-Americans go to Haiti with, right? Um, you know, so when they encounter a class of very much, you know, entrepreneurial, Haitian market women, some of the reaction immediately is, is where are the men, you know, put, put simply, um, you know, so there, there's, again, both in the rural and urban environments, there's, um, 
uh, you see those discrepancies plays out. Uh, and as Lamont says, that's not necessarily just a story about um, uh, in which we see national difference playing out, that there's uh, very much a class-based element to it, that uh, there's a gender-based element to it, right, about what's not only respectability or even uplift for the, the race will look like, but then what uh, uh, respectable womanhood will look like, what respectable manhood looks like, uh, right? So all this to say is that uh, oftentimes when we see national difference, we're also seeing, I think, too, it, or differences of class and differences, uh, uh, differences of class that also, also relate to ideas about gender and sexuality as well, too. Um, I'll probably stop there because I don't think we got a lot of other things to discuss. <laughs> yeah, we've already got lots of questions um, in the Q&A. And just a reminder to everyone, if you want to ask a question live, you can raise your hand. You can send an email to Rachel. There's an address in the chat. You can put something in the Q&A. I'm going to probably pop back and forth trying to balance the topics and so on so that we get a you know, kind of good mix of things. But I'm going to start with my co-chair, Eric Arneson. Um, who emailed me this morning and said, oh, this book is good. I have questions. So I'm going to let Eric start out. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. This is the co-chair's prerogative to, to squeeze in uh, the first questions. Um, there's so much in this book that we could probably only scratch the surface uh, in an hour and a half session like this. But I've got a few things that uh, I, I want to ask you about. Um, and the first question touches a little bit on what you just said. Uh, but I want to frame it a little differently. And I think to most academics, uh, the notion of Black internationalism brings to mind radical critiques, uh, critiques of colonialism and capitalism, as well as of racism. But the internationalism of the 19th century that you write about is somewhat different. And you very carefully lay out the assumptions that informed the encounter on the US side, many of those who uh, encountered Haiti and Haitians were Protestants uh, and American citizens of the United States. And that meant that they approached their Haitian counterparts with a certain lens, a cultural lens of, of cultural superiority embedded in kind of a uh, Christian Protestant civilizationism, uh, uh, kind of a phrase that, that appears. Um, and so they saw themselves in your telling as coming from a more advanced, perhaps superior civilization, notwithstanding uh, the racism in the United States. So I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about the encounter between uh, African Americans in the 19th century uh, and the nation of Haiti uh, and its people uh, with this notion of kind of Protestant civilization um, uh, at its core. Yeah, it, it's a phenomenal question. Uh, and so to, to, to try to grapple with a lot of these complexities of uh, particularly late 19th uh, Black political thought. Uh, you know, for me, with Wilson, Jeremiah, Moses, his scholarship is still, uh, in many ways, it's, it's, it's the starting point. Uh, that the, the, the way that he deals with uh, the nuances, the complexities of folks like Cromel, uh, you know, even folks like, like Booker T. Washington, uh, is just, uh, it's still there, there's lessons to be gleaned from it. And so for me, that was a real starting point. Uh, and, and remains that way. So yeah, when I when I think of uh, when I think of black internationalism, uh, right, in uh, the an American historical review form just came out of it. And unfortunately, I haven't had the chance to read it yet. I'm excited to dive into it. Uh, you know, so I'm taking the, the lead from folks, uh, you know, scholars like uh Mika McElhaney, Keisha Blaine, uh, you know, and, and there's a host of others, right? Uh, but in uh, just really thinking of it, as, and of course, Michael O. West, uh, uh, Fanache Wilkins, the, uh, William Martin, their great uh, edited volume on uh, Black internationalism, uh, really thinking of it as uh, a project and an aspiration, really uh, this idea and this practice of shared struggle, of uh, forging common cause, of identifying unity, uh, across, of course, national boundaries, uh, also across imperial boundaries, uh, just a real sort of uh, shared struggle for purpose of liberation, uh, for the purpose of freedom, 
Um, and so uh, to me, of course, it's a project in, in aspiration um, that then raises raises questions, right? About that I think as a project, it, it's it's in flux and is is constantly in work, right? Uh, that the terms of uh, of what exactly liberation will look like are um, not necessarily things that may be brought into that work of collaboration, but have to be worked out through collaboration, right? Um, and so it's in in approaching uh, approaching it with those ideas uh, that I really tried to take these actors who certainly possess an international consciousness uh, to take their ideas and practices in context and on the terms in which they understood them, right? Uh, so let me try to make that less abstract, right? So I have a, uh, uh, there's one part of the book, it's around 1909 or so, uh, where John Hurst, uh, who is a, um, in the time, he's a, he's a pretty influential uh, member of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, he, he will go on to become a bishop. And uh, he's talking to a crowd of African Americans uh, in Washington, D.C. And uh, John Hurst, I should say, too, he is, he is Haitian. He's a Haitian citizen. Uh, but he's also the son of two African American immigrants uh, to 19th century Haiti. And uh, so when he's talking to this crowd of African Americans in uh, Washington, D.C., he says, when I'm back in Haiti, uh, they all ask me what's happened to African Americans. Uh, because he, he says, they say, have they relinquished their rights since Reconstruction? Basically, have, have they given up? And uh, he says, I tell them no, uh, right? He said, I, I tell them that they're still fighting for their rights, uh, but the obstacles since Reconstruction have only ramped up, they've only escalated. Um, and so then he goes on to tell that audience of African Americans in DC uh, that conversely, when I'm here in the US, I hear folks saying, what's wrong with Haiti? including African-Americans, uh, saying, are Haitians just a warmongering people? And so he says, basically, what we have here is a problem of propaganda and misunderstanding. What we have here is an understanding of the race uh, or a misunderstanding of the race across these national boundaries that is caused by the representations of both African-Americans and Haitians in the US press. So what he says is we need a practice of robust uh, dissemination of black newspapers across any names, Cuba, Haiti, uh, of course the US and some other sites. He says we need practices of translation so that the race can better know itself, right? If that's not a project of black internationalism, right? Then I'm not really sure what is. Uh, so that's part of how I approach that. And that's what I mean by trying to approach this as a project and aspiration on the terms and in the context in which these actors that I'm looking at, in which they understood it. Um, and again, if that's not internationals, I'm not really sure uh, what is. Uh, but to the, uh, uh, you know, to, to the point of the, uh, about, uh, you know, some of the nuances here, um, you know, this is certainly, uh, this is an era in which I think not only context, but even some of the possibilities for liberatory struggle look, look a bit different. This is an era in which um, there's still very much a discourse of civilizationism in which uh, a, a really uphill battle against, uh, you know, a scientific racist discourse, you know, the most virulent ideas of the quote unquote Negro problem are, are very real and they confront uh, these intellectuals at every turn, right? Um, you know, so the so those are the things I think you see playing out in terms of this internationalist or pan Africanist discourse, uh, where you see uh, some of this vanguardism, right? Where even where you have a very pronounced anti-racist statement, and even anti-imperial statement for somebody like Frederick Douglass in 1893, right? Where he proclaims um, Haiti to be the star of the North. Right. Uh, in that same sort of speech, and this is uh, here I'm referencing a speech he gives um, in conjunction uh, with his work as Haiti's uh, representative at Chicago World's Fair, even as he's saying that and saying that Haiti will be the black man's country now and forever, uh, he will say things like, um, oh, um, 
uh, you know, there, there's still an issue with, uh, with voting that needs to be uh, overcome for Haiti to reach its potential as the black man's country, right? Um, you know, so there's still, there's still very much, uh, as you put it, uh, uh, you know, so some ways in which uh, the Protestantism of many of the folks engaged uh, in this work of international solidarity determines the grounds on which solidarity is pursued, in which uh, some ideas of American exceptionalism, uh, you know, in uh, you know, in, in which those uh, come into the discourse very prominently. Uh, you know, so th there's a way there's a way in which again uh, the terms of solidarity are very much in flux, and they they're 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 up for debate. And that that is one thing that I will say here too. Uh, that it's a constant sort of um, uh, uh, multi-vocal debate and discourse about what, uh, what liberation for Haiti and then what liberation for African-Americans uh, will look like, a debate amongst uh, just a, a wide swath, diplomats, missionaries, editors, um, you know, you name it, who are really thinking through um, what solidarity and, and what, what freedom is going to look like and how it's going to be achieved. Thank you. Eric, you had one more question, right? Yes. So let's move up in time a little bit. And your final chapter um, deals with W.E.B. Du Bois and his complex and evolving response to uh, the U.S. occupation, conquest, domination of Haiti. And I'm wondering, um, why you selected Du Bois, and if mm -hmm. you can say something about his transition here, um, you make reference to a number of other figures, James Weldon Johnson, you know, who comes mm -hmm. back from an investigation, <laughs> with a very hard-hitting report, um, Hubert Harrison um, mm -hmm. spares no words here, um, um, uh, A. Philip Randolph and the messenger crowd, kind of the Black socialists are absolutely savage uh, in their critique of American domination uh, and the occupation. Du Bois, it, you take a bit longer to, to get to that point. So I know that I'm sure the press did not give you unlimited word length. Um, so that's always an issue. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, why you picked Du Bois as opposed to perhaps a different cast of characters. Um, mm -hmm. Just say something more for, for the folks listening about his take to the, uh, uh, take on uh, the invasion and occupation and how that changed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's another great question. Uh, yeah, so that was uh, that was one of the more difficult uh, decisions uh, in the manuscript uh, because really there was uh, there was a cast of uh, a cast of characters uh, to to choose from or even not to choose from. You know, if I wanted to present a broader mosaic of, of black thought in that era, um, and it's really uh, it's really interesting that that occupation era is when uh, you know when we talk about. Uh, context and possibilities, you know, in an era where there's a more robust radical black press, where there, there are sites of, of growing then Caribbean migration to the US, you know, most obviously Harlem, right? Uh, so you have more even exchange, uh, you have a more robust uh, critique of capitalism in that moment, right? Uh, you know, so even what uh, this this discourse and these practices of internationalism looks like, uh, it's a uh, it's a bit it's a bit different than in, in other places. Uh, you know, in, in the text and the manuscript, and it's one uh, it's an it's an environment, a political environment that in many ways invites a broader cast of characters uh, to sort of weigh in on this question of of the fate of Haiti, uh, and it is. Uh, it, 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 it is everybody. It's uh, it's members of the NAACP, uh, of the Urban League, uh, Black Club Women, uh, the ICWDR, International Council of uh, Women of Darker Darker Races of the World. Uh, uh, it, it's it just you name a black organization, you know the the black press. Um, it, it, name a black organization. Name a black thinker. Uh, you know, organic, self-taught, 
uh, to the most lettered intellectual, they are thinking about Haiti in that moment. Um, and of course, they're thinking about other questions, thinking about Haiti in relations to other questions about uh, anti-colonialism and anti-imperialism, right? Uh, but anyways, uh, Du Bois. So why out of all of that uh, did I select Du Bois? Uh, in part is because I really wanted to, uh, I really wanted to think further about some of the things about Du Bois I was encountering in the scholarship. And this, uh, put simply, uh, some of the things I was encountering were sort of taking Du Bois, um, not, not in a static fashion, I don't wanna say that, you know, I don't wanna be reductive, uh, but sort of taking his opposition to the US occupation uh, as his initial standpoint. And I guess, put simply, that's not what I was seeing in the sources. And, um, you know, so that's one thing, but that's not necessarily a reason to then sort of take him as a central figure. Uh, I guess the, the bigger reason why was that I saw a bit more ambivalence at the beginning for the boys at the beginning of the occupation of Haiti that in many ways was more in line with some of the ambivalence that you know, sort of I, I was encountering elsewhere, right? Um, but also uh, for me, there was sort of a question then if we take the boys as the central figure here, and if we also treat his ideas about Haiti as maybe being more in flux than maybe we previously appreciated, then uh, then what do we see? I do we see some some broader things then, right? And uh, I guess the answer is I I I think we do. Uh, I think that if we uh, really take seriously, uh, first that he did have some sort of uh, initial ambivalence, or he's he's uh, he doesn't necessarily have this sort of radical opposition to the to the invasion at the the minute Marines land on the ground. Uh, but we take uh, seriously his need to really sort of uh, engage with uh, the material circumstance of Haiti at that moment uh, to, uh, to engage with what Haitian anti-occupation activists themselves are saying, uh, to really think seriously about news he was getting from Haiti. Uh, then to me, I think we really see about how that work of internationalism is, is produced in many ways. I think we really see the how the work of internationalism is arrived at and then sort of continued as a process and continue continually work through. I think that's what we see through looking at Du Bois in that moment. Um, and uh, the other thing I think we see too is uh, the broader, uh, uh, how to put this, for me, looking at Du Bois in that moment of occupation and the ways he's thinking about the occupation teaches us a lot about uh, Haiti's connections and demystifies a lot of those tropes of exceptionalism. Because uh, I guess put more directly, what we see happening with Du Bois there in that moment is the way he's deriving much bigger and even international and global lessons from the fate of Haiti and the situation of Haiti in that moment, right? Where he's drawing lessons uh, about uh, uh, Haiti in relationship with the rest of the Caribbean, in relationship with the rest of uh, you know, the, the colonized world. And he really does uh, derive an analysis of Haiti as being colonized and as uh, not only colonized, but as being enslaved in that moment, right? So that broader critique, right, amongst many radicals in that moment of, uh, you know, colonization and imperialism as a, a status of enslavement, right? Uh, so he's drawing much bigger lessons, right? And so then for him, the liberation of Haiti uh, really stands in for a greater liberation of the oppressed, a greater liberation of those uh, who are shackled by colonialism, imperialism, Jim Crow in the U.S., uh, who are at the bottom rungs of a uh, 
a racial and, uh, and this of course for Du Bois becomes paramount, uh, a racial and socioeconomic hierarchy. Uh, so those are some of the reasons why, you know, ultimately you know, I said, let's run with Du Bois uh, here. Brandon, thank you so much for these super thoughtful reflections. Really super interesting um, just to hear you um, thinking through the, the book and beyond. Um, so some questions from uh, folks who are joining us. Uh, first of all, I love this, just a comment from Richard Willing. Thanks for your great work. <laughs> Gotta like a comment like that. And um, also uh, Richard asks, um, to what extent was Haiti considered a destination for folks in North Carolina post-emancipation? That is, does Haiti become a place, you started with North Carolina, um, yeah. so, and you started with Haiti and um, Haiti. And mm -hmm. so the question is, is there a real North Carolina to Haiti highway? Is that a real story? Uh, so, so in here, uh, you know, I, I gotta, uh, I gotta plug some of uh, Laurent's work. I think, um, Ron, where do you say it? it's the uh, the thinking Haiti's nineteenth century article? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, so for those of y'all who, who aren't familiar with it, I'm sure, uh, uh, honestly, most folks tuning in probably are. But uh, uh, one of Laurent's articles, uh, thinking Haiti's nineteenth century, uh, makes a a very important uh, article that uh, one of the ways to uh, one of the narratives about nineteenth century Haiti. Uh, that we need to give far more attention to, to have a more robust understanding of Haiti's 19th century, is this history of African-American immigration uh, to Haiti. And basically, so there's two, uh, two waves uh, of African-American immigration uh, to Haiti, and really Afro-North American uh, immigration to Haiti, 1820s and then 1859, 1861. Um, the first wave, uh, we think upwards of 12,000 uh, Afro-North Americans go. Uh, the second wave, we think upwards of 2,000. And uh, my reason for hesitancy is that, uh, you know, there, there's some, some excellent scholarship on, uh, on both of these waves, but uh, uh, in many respects, these are things where, um, you know, we, we would really benefit from even more scholarship uh, in terms of uh, the exact numbers of African American and Afro North Americans who go. Uh, not only the exact number of Afro North Americans uh, that go, uh, but also uh, uh, how many are going to, how many ultimately stay. Because this is, in many respects, is a narrative that has sort of overemphasized those who who go and then return uh, to the United States or even to Canada, right? And uh, we have little, again, not to be simplistic, but we do have a pretty little understanding about those communities that remain uh, either in, uh, particularly those that remain in Haiti. We know a bit more that remain uh, in Samana, which is when they go, especially those that go in the 1820s, which is uh, part of Haiti, um, you know, at that moment when Haiti, uh, has jurisdiction, uh, you know, over the entire island, uh, but will remain there, uh, you know, and still there, right? I'm thinking of Christina Davidson's excellent work. Uh, you know, so this is a this is a really this is a really huge history of immigration, right? Uh, you know, honestly, for the the for the, the 19th century, this is uh, numerically uh, a a bigger migratory movement uh, even than that to uh, Liberia. Um, you know, so we need more scholarship on it. Uh, to the uh, to this this question, you know, there's not um, so part of why the, these uh, this migration is so large uh, is that in those two moments, the 1820s and then late 1850s, early 1860s, this is state sponsored immigration, right? Uh, so Haitian governments are funding uh, Afro North Americans to come. Right, uh, largely for purposes uh, with the expectation that they would be uh, uh, agricultural laborers. Uh, so that's part of what, part of what stimulates this. Uh, and you don't have that um, sort of state sponsorship in the late 19th century. Um, you know, so that's one of the reasons why it's more. Um, uh, Haiti remains a site of sort of imagined uh, migration, right? Uh, 
And uh, I, I would argue, and I, I, I don't think this is, you know, sort of a controversial argument uh, whatsoever, that uh, there, there's a through line, there, like there's constant uh, uh, imagining of immigration uh, among African-Americans uh, in the late 19th, early 20th century, right? Uh, immigration, not only to, uh, to a West in, in the United States, right? Uh, not only imagining of, you know, going to Oklahoma or Kansas or then ultimately going to the West Coast, but also outside of the boundaries of, of the U.S., right? Um, you know, but the, the reasons why there, you know, the a migration of the size that we see in the earlier uh, decades of the, tw of the 19th century doesn't materialize are manifold, but one of the reasons is that uh, there's not that, that state sponsorship, right? Um, uh, there's also, uh, you know, there, there's other sites, right? You know, of course, by the time we reach the turn of the 20th century, right, the U.S. North, uh, you know, becomes more of a, uh, a promised land, a destination, uh, uh, you know, certainly for, for Black Southerners. Can I just add one little quick thing? Do you mind, Karen? Okay. No, no. Um, I mean, I think one of the, and this just, it's one of these reframing gestures for Haiti. Obviously people tend to think of Haiti now as a place from which people leave, right? As, as a kind of source of, but in the 19th century, this really was, it, it wasn't just African-Americans, right? It's also migration yeah. within the Caribbean to Haiti from Germany, from the Middle East, right? There's this kind of, so in fact, it's, a, it's this kind of magnet for a lot of different types of of migrants. And I think that's pretty interesting too, that so African-Americans are, are a group moving into a society in which there are other migrants moving into rural areas. I mean, sorry, especially urban areas. Um, and that point that's so key is that the, this is one of those histories that's been written by those who came back um, yeah. and the history of those who remained. I think what, that's why maybe the work on Holly that you're going to do is so vital because then, you know, you have Holly who founds the church and and his descendants, you know, this is a family, continues to be an important family in Haiti today, right? So there's obviously yeah. this huge imprint of, of African-American migration there. So it's, it's important to, you know, to tell both sides of that. So. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And that, uh, this is, so on, on the Hollies, uh, it's a story that really, uh, you know, Ron, as you say, like that, that history of, uh, of migration to Haiti has been told not only from the, the perspective of those that return, but also told in a way that uh, uh, in many ways is much more uh, much more static and not only static, but much more, um, uh, even much more, and this is, uh, this is not the most articulate way, but much more past than we often think of as histories of migration, right? Also, I think when we think of different contexts, and certainly in a U.S. context, right? You know, when we think of national myths of exceptionalism, right? Uh, the the myth of a nation of immigrants is very much a myth in which immigration is is constant and very much is a history of the present and is very much uh, tied into uh, constant migratory flows, right? And uh, we don't necessarily we we haven't told that history of migration to Haiti in the same sort of uh, fluid uh, manner, right? Uh, and that's one uh, thing. So uh, uh, with Holly, you know, when I talk to uh, in Natalie Holly, he's uh, the great, great, great granddaughter of uh, the Bishop. Uh, you know, that's one of the things that I've learned very much from her, the need to do that, right? Uh, you know, because it's just not, uh, it, this is not a, a history that you can just tell as, you know, well, it begins in 1859 and we stop in 1861 when people leave. Yeah. Right? I mean, that, that, that sounds ridiculous if you apply it to any other yeah, context. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah. And since we're in Washington, or at least virtually in Washington, you know, it's a story that starts right in Washington, right? Where Holly learns about Haiti. Right. I mean, it's a, anyway, we'll wait for your book on the topic, but yeah. just. <laughs> but <laughs> Here's another question for you. Um, this is from Aaron Chapman. Um, so um, Aaron also thanks you for the engaging presentation of your work and has two questions. Um, so one is a question, I completely love this question always, which is what are some of the most surprising aspects of African-American engagements with Haiti, with Haiti that your research revealed? Like, I love mm -hmm. that kind of question about like, yeah. what, was, what was surprising in your research. Um, and then the second question is um, a more specific question, which is about Mary Renda's work on taking mm -hmm. Haiti and how useful and important and how much did you engage with that? Um, so two-part question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Renda's work's incredible. 
uh, you know, for, for me, it's uh, not just <laughs> for me, that makes it sound like, uh, uh, like I'm unique here. Uh, I think for, for, for pretty much anybody, uh, uh, doing work on the uh, the first year's occupation, uh, you know, her book is still like you know, it's it's one of the the first that that you've got to go to, uh, and so it's a, I it's a really capacious, uh, really capacious book, you know. So folks like uh, I'm trying to think of the uh, uh, the black uh, the black activists uh, and thinkers that are uh, very prominent in the book. If I remember correctly, I think like James Weldon Johnson is uh, is pretty prominent. Um, so yeah, it, it was certainly one that, uh, that was, uh, that was foundational to me that, that I was, that I was engaging with that, uh, that I hope to build, um, that I hope to build on that I, again, that I hope to be in conversation with. And I'm thinking, uh, uh, thematically, um, yeah, the, thematically, uh, it was probably, uh, one of the ways is most most helpful that, uh, of course, uh, with her attention to gender and how that shaped, you know, ideas about not only ideas but uh, ideas about power and also impositions of power. Uh, that was certainly instructive in that regard. Um, other ways, yeah, I would have to think in other ways. I think that's the most obvious. That's the most obvious way. Um, in terms of the most surprising things uh, that came across, so I'll, I'll try to mention one of the more the more challenging uh, sources to come across. Uh, William Pickens's William Pickens' speech on Haiti that he gives in 1902. Uh, so at the time, William Pickens. Uh, and he would go on to be most well known as a very um, influential member of the NAACP. Um, before then, though, he is uh, he first becomes a more sort of minor celebrity, if you will, in 1902, when at that time he's a student at Yale, one of the only uh, black students at Yale at the time, uh, one of the first black students in Yale's history. And uh, in that time, he wins uh, the Ten Ike Prize for oratory. And these oratorical uh, uh, competitions are very important uh, in the Ivies, uh, you know, at that moment, and probably outside the Ivies too. Uh, but, you know, they're, they're certainly important there. And uh, he wins it with his oration on Haiti. And uh, it's a very, uh, you know, put simply, it's a very imperialistic. Uh, oratory on Haiti, where uh, he later uh, he would later say uh, that you know I I entered this work uh, you know uh, having heard about Haiti, but you know understand I need to do a lot of research you know so I dug into uh, you know a number of different sources and from that uh, you know, I really came to this understanding that. Uh, that Haiti needed the hand of a stronger power. Uh, put simply, uh, it's an oratory in which he uh, he calls for uh, uh, the U.S. annexation of Haiti, which is uh, part of a broader politi U.S. political discourse at the time. Now, the reasons for um, and uh, before getting the reasons, uh, and you know how to grapple with this. Uh, you know, uh, just a couple more things about uh, Pickens' background. So he. Uh, He's a son of uh, formerly enslaved people uh, and sharecroppers uh, uh, in Arkansas. And uh, part of how he gets uh, to Yale is with uh, support from uh, Booker T. Washington. And so he's very much, um, uh, I think for, for Pickens at that time, uh, Washington is sort of the, uh, the man that he would look to as, as being most influential on his own thought. Uh, so, so now like how, how, how to grapple with these sources uh, uh, with that source, uh, with this oratory, uh, that it seemed that first this, uh, this, you know, this really sort of unabashed and explicit call for uh, the annexation of Haiti was really rooted in, uh, actually, uh, he probably did dig into uh, a number of, uh, of sources about Haiti before preparing uh, his oratory. I have no reason to, uh, to think that he didn't. 
but um, the the sources that were available to him and that he dug into, uh, uh, these were sources that were um, conducive to that type of analysis, to that type of analysis calling for the annexation of Haiti. Uh, the the press of Haiti and the uh, about Haiti in that moment, you know, really, you know, sort of outside of, uh, you know, some some black newspapers uh, that that did take a defense of Haiti outside of those. Um, these are sources that really, um, you know, had uh, you know to take an anachronistic um, word for it that really perpetuated this understanding of Haiti as a failed state. Uh, so I do think that uh, Pickens is influenced by those broader discourses. Um, you know, I think for him that uh, a uh, a expanded role for the U.S. in Haitian affairs, uh, I think from his perspective, um, that it's sort of, and this gets back to these, uh, you know, some of these complexities that Eric mentioned in the beginning, that uh, part of this is a civilizationist impulse, uh, that for him that then would lead to questions then, okay, then who would have a leading role within this US control of Haitian affairs. I think for him then that, that would look like um, uh, African Americans and you know, um, you know, Tuskegee officials taking a governing role over Haitian uh, agricultural development. That um, you know, influential uh, black men and you know, part of this is masculineness. That black men like Washington uh, would play a more decisive role in uh, giving Haitians uh, good governance in that time. You know, so there's, there's that, these elements of vanguardism. There's these, the, very much a civilization's discourse. There's very much an idea that this is the way that uh, the Haitian state is going to become the Haiti that uh, African-Americans and the Afro-diasporic population need. So I guess put another way, this is an idea uh, this is, again, a very, very clearly imperialistic discourse and idea that I think in some ways is rooted in an idea of solidarity, but a solidarity with a sort of idea of Haiti or a solidarity with an idea of Haiti that very much privileges uh, a sort of state-centered, a state-centered idea of Haiti and also very much is aspirational that very much is coming from a place uh, about what, uh, what the race, quote unquote, the race needed in terms of representation, right? Um, so it's very, much a, it's very much a part of this broader concern with the fate of Haiti, very much a part of this broader idea that the fate of Haiti was linked to the fate of African-Americans. Uh, and the other thing I'll say about, you know, counting this challenging source, uh, Part of how, um, you know, ultimately the way in which I approached it was also uh, from the lens of critics of that speech in that moment, right? Uh, so ultimately it wasn't just me saying, um, you know, it's, it's not a presentist um, thing to say, and it's always, like, this is a broader, like, like it's never a presentist thing to say. All these things like we say, well, it's presentist to critique, you know, this sort of racist discourse of the past. It's like, no, people were critiquing them in real time. And there's ample evidence of this, even with this pick and speech within the quote unquote black community, right? Because it's never of one mind, even this quote unquote community. Uh, so uh, William Monroe Trotter, uh, you know, the, the militant black editor in Boston takes uh, Pickens to task in that moment. Uh, who else? Uh, I'm trying to think who else. Uh, yeah, a number of uh, uh, voices, uh, Black voices, take Pickens to task. Monroe Trotter just happens to be the one that is, uh, and those of you who know Trotter uh, will know this is true to his character and nature. He's just the most uh, vocal and most vehement about it. Uh, he says, uh, Pickens, and you've never been to Haiti. You don't know anything about Haiti. You have no grounds to speak about Haiti. Right, I mean, he's right. <laughs> he said, this is basically said, this is not what solidarity uh, looks like. It doesn't look like, uh, you know, basically ridiculing the race in a way that uh, basically Trotter says, what it looks like to me 
is that you're just trying to curry the favor of white Americans who think these negative things about black people wherever they exist. And he says, uh, Pickens, what you need to understand is that point that this is what, what you are saying, these negative things that you're repeating about, hey, this is what white people think of all of us. So part of the work of solidarity is understanding that. And part of the work of solidarity is understanding that uh, across uh, you know, the, these quote unquote, where, where you, whereas you are sort of reifying national difference, uh, you need to be understanding the things that, uh, that link us, even if it is just something as simple as uh, the ways in which we exist in a uh, white supremacist imagination, right? Um, yeah, so that, that was one of the sources that, that sticks to me as uh, a surprising one and one that uh, you know, was challenging in some respects. Thank you. That's, oh, I love that question and really thoughtful answer. Super interesting to hear you talk about that. Okay, we've got a bunch of questions. So I'm thinking lightning round. Let's see uh, what we can do. What do you think? So I got, okay. I got to be shorter in my responses is what you're saying. <laughs> well, I don't really want to push you to do that because <laughs> actually every time I'm like, oh my God, these your answers are really full and thoughtful and rewarding, I think for all of us. But I'm going to, you know, we'll go with lightning round here at the end just to get through some questions so people feel like they have participated here. And plus, there's some really great questions here. All right. So first lightning round question here. And I'm summarizing, guys. So sorry. I'm going to summarize your question. So um, first lightning round question is, how about the Harlem Renaissance? What about art and culture as well as, um, you know, politics and intellectual leadership, visions of Haiti? Uh, big, uh, big, critical. Uh, I touch on it uh, much less than other scholars due to that focus on Du Bois, uh, but uh, enough can't be said about the role that Haiti and in particular the Haitian Revolution play in uh, the artistic production and intellectual production of the Harlem Renaissance. Awesome, okay. Um, Next question. That's that's really good. All right, we're going to crank here. Okay, uh, this is also from Sean Ryan. I'm giving Sean. I'm giving both your questions here. So, what about how average African Americans um, thought about Haiti, um, as opposed to the kind of leaders that you're talking about? Yeah. Uh, so I'll mention one moment uh, from actually the first chapter. So the U.S. gives diplomatic grants, diplomatic already gives terrible. Uh, finally concedes uh, that Haiti is an independent state uh, in 1862. Uh, and so the first, uh, at that point, uh, the first Haitian diplomatic representatives come uh, to the US. Uh, when they do, it, uh, as you could perhaps imagine, uh, becomes a, a very much uh, of interest to a wide swath of African-Americans, regardless of class. Uh, so when uh, the Haitian diplomat first arrives in Washington, uh, the strong evidence that uh, in Washington is a site where uh, many, many uh, formerly enslaved people uh, congregate and uh, uh, particularly as part of the, you know, quote unquote contraband camps are right outside of DC. And so they, uh, they seem to have just, you know, they're, 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 they're trying to meet them, they're rushing to meet them. Uh, and there, there's, some, there's some challenges. Uh, uh, to that, uh, that they're not, uh, oftentimes they're not able to have uh, even that those meetings and that relationship uh, with the Haitian diplomat that they want, uh, but it's very much something that they desire because very clearly uh, Haiti has this, this salience to them and especially, uh, you know, as embodied, uh, you know, by the Haitian diplomat in that moment. Uh, and so that, that's just one moment. And there's other moments uh, like that, uh, but I will say that, uh, you know, the book does skew uh, towards, uh, you know, towards towards the letter, towards uh, diplomats, missionaries, editors, uh, educators, writers, uh, those types of folks. Uh, but I do try to give glimpses of when it's uh, when it's ordinary folks really uh, really thinking about Haiti. Awesome. Okay. Um, this is actually a related question, at least in my own mind, um, which is. The extent to which um, the kind of intellectual leaders um, and political leaders that you're talking about really see um, their struggles as, and the way they're thinking about Haiti as the kind of vanguard for freedom struggles for non-Black people as well. 
Um, and this is a question from Mitch. And Mitch asks particularly um, for other people seeking liberation and self-government, so the Irish, Hungarians, Greeks, English Catholics, etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a. I, I think for sure it's a phenomenon. By uh, you know, by the end of the book, when I'm, you know, in the era of the occupation, and again, it gets back to our earlier uh, question about you know, sort of context and possibilities, right? Uh, that there's very much a an interest and a need uh, for folks like Du Bois in connecting uh, Haiti's struggle to other struggles for liberation across the world. And I think that that is the, uh, that's the scope of Black internationalist work in that moment. Uh, that is certainly about the fate of Black people seeking liberation in occupied Haiti, uh, you know, but it's also the work of uh, you know, it's a broader anti-colonial work that transcends even, you know, the quote unquote black world that, that gets into, uh, uh, you know, broader, a broader terrain of class struggle, a broader terrain of anti-colonial struggle. Uh, and you see this even, uh, you know, even rhetorically in, in the area of occupation, there's, uh, there's constant, even like you see this, not just in language, but even, uh, uh, yeah, just the, the signage. So you will have anti-occupation activism uh, in the U.S. and also in Haiti too. Uh, shall like a common refrain, uh, shall Haiti be your Congo? Uh, but then also drawing connections between Haiti and Ireland, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Africa, Africa for the Africans, Haiti for the Haitians, uh, Ireland for the Irish, you know, all these things, right? Uh, uh, that this is the sort of the common parlance. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. I think um, uh, I, I think that there's a way that um, uh, it becomes. I, I won't say, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm I'm being long winded again here. It becomes not necessarily uh, like nor I don't want to use the word normative, but it becomes sort of. So I guess the way to put it is uh, like that sort of broad international and very like profound international, that's becomes the work of, uh, and Karen, I think you mentioned like Hubert Harrison earlier, or maybe it was Eric, that becomes the work of uh, Hubert Harrison, but it's also the work of the ICWDR, you know, these black club women. It's also the work of James Weldon Johnson. It's also the work of, um, uh, to, to a lesser extent, perhaps a less radical extent, uh, the Urban League, right? Uh, you know, so that it really is something that I think cr cuts across uh, uh, a, a Black political spectrum, right? Uh, so then I think some of the question, uh, uh, some of the implications is if that's the sort of, uh, if that sort of really, really profound politics is sort of uh, cuts across the black political spectrum, right? Uh, then I think we have to, that encourages us to think about the costs of then the anti-radicalism uh, to come, you know, very quickly. Great, thank you. One thing I'm noticing is that people are asking for references and things here. So um, we will try to get to those questions too. But here's a question from Wendy Shermer, which is um, earlier in the conversation, you mentioned African-Americans champion Haiti as a modern alternative to the European imperial order. Can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit more about how you define or conceptualize modern and modernity? Yeah. Just a uh, small question there. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, I mean, one, one of the things I tried to do is to, uh, to try to point out when, uh, so in thinking about these ideas of Haiti, uh, when those ideas of Haiti are wrapped up in ideas of, modernity and progress and when as a as a consequence when those ideas of Haiti as being wrapped up in ideas of modernity and progress then lead to some of those um uh this sort of uh incongruences uh if you will right um so when it's very clear that uh for somebody you know just to take a well uh uh, maybe one of the more well-known examples, Frederick Douglass is, uh, I think very much his ideas of Haiti are in, in many ways very radical and profound ideas uh, of Haiti as being its sovereignty as being key to any sort of meaningful freedom for 
uh, black people wherever they exist in Africa, uh, uh, in the continent or in the diaspora, right? But they're also tied up in ideas of modernity and, pro and progress as being projects of industrialization, uh, uh, of capitalism, of uh, in some ways a, a, a Protestantism at least as sort of even a sort of uh, a broader sort of secularization, uh, even like sort of for D Douglas is oftentimes like sort of secular notions of Protestant that are more tied into ideas of like a Protestant work ethic. Um, so yeah, so I, I, I think that's more, more of the work that, that I engage in in text is really trying to grapple with those moments in which these ideas of Haiti are wrapped up into ideas of modernity and progress that are, that are oftentimes uh, incongruent with um, uh, maybe incongruent is not the word that maybe lead to a uh, a lack of nuance in approaching uh, the realities of uh, of everyday Haitian life or even of its relationship to other states. Okay, here's a really important question. Um, this is from Belly, um, who asks about readings for students in high school, grades nine through 12, about Haiti. That seems like a huge question to me, but a really <laughs> important one. Um, and yeah. I think really indicative of um, lots of the public engagement that you and Laurent were talking about before. We're in a moment here and people wanna take advantage of that moment. So do you have thoughts on that? Uh, yeah. Uh, so the best, uh, the best, Introduction, the best uh, book that you, you can point your students to is gonna be Laurent's uh, Aftershocks of History. Uh, dig into that. Uh, for, uh, for primary sources, uh, actually uh, Laurent just uh, uh, co-edited an incredible volume, uh, The Haiti Reader, that, that can introduce your students to a number of uh, really excellent primary sources from a uh, literally across the entire gamut uh, of Haitian history. Uh, so th th those are the two that I would uh, most immediately point uh, you and your students to. Um, and then there's a there's a wide uh, uh, there's a number of sources too, uh, especially uh, that are now uh, uh, sort of digi digitally available sources. That's very inarticulate, but I'm thinking of things like uh, if you look at places like Black Perspectives. Uh, I'm probably getting the name, uh, but uh, Haiti, uh, Haiti and Island Luminous. I was getting Haiti, a luminous island, Haiti and Island Luminous. It's one of uh, it's Island Luminous, yeah, yeah, Island the, Luminous, the, the digital yeah, library yeah. of the Caribbean, um, digital library of the Caribbean. So, check out all those places for uh, both primary sources, uh, shorter, uh, shorter sort of historical analysis of moments in Haitian history. Uh, you know, I think those are, I'm trying to think any other, so the, those are the, the starting points that I would recommend. I'm just gonna put in the chat too, uh, I did a short comic uh, history of the Haitian revolution with a Haitian artist named Rocky Cotard. Um, and I know a lot of high schoolers, high schools have been using that. So I'll pop that in there too. I mean, if you're looking for something kind of shorter and easier and you can download it from the site that I'm gonna put in here um, as well and purchase copies too, so from the artist, so. Fantastic. Okay, that's great. Um, we've been putting lots of links in the chat. Um, I, I'm a big fan of links in the chat. I think that's awesome. Lots of good references mm -hmm. here. Okay, um, a here's a question for you, Brandon, um, from Michael. He says, Gettysburg resident here. Any comments on Haiti and Haitians during the American Civil War? Mm -hmm. uh, so in the, in, the, in, the, in the spirit of uh, you know, what we're doing here in a and what we are accomplished here is scholars recognizing that we're part of uh, bigger scholarly conversations. Uh, check out Matthew Clavin's work, uh, which isn't, you know, it's, it, you know it, it's, it's not about, you know, Haitians in the American Civil War, it's, you know, more about uh, uh, how ideas of Haiti and how Americans, both black and white understandings of Haiti influence their understandings of the Civil War. Uh, especially for Black Americans and even, uh, you know, white abolitionists, their ideas of the Civil War as being uh, a similar opportunity for self-deliverance, a similar opportunity 
for, um, you know, an emancipationist, to wage an emancipationist struggle uh, for pro-slavery forces in which their idea, uh, you know, their, their fears, their, uh, you know, their pejorative associations of the Haitian Revolution as, you know, this cataclysmic event, uh, you know, in which it informed their understandings of the Civil War as potentially uh, being a similar sort of cat cataclysmic event in which they would, uh, you know, put simply lose their slaveholding uh, privileges and everything that that entailed. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's a really, it's a really good book. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, so in terms of, you know, also to your question, the thing that it raises mind too is, of course, uh, like the ways in which uh, the Haitian people and the Haitian state uh, celebrate John Brown, uh, which, you know, is, is preceding, uh, you know, the Civil War a little bit. You know, but things like, uh, you know, uh, state mandated period of mourning for John Brown, uh, naming, uh, uh, you know, eventually, uh, you know, streets, uh, you know, for John Brown, uh, you know, uh, 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 funeral uh, processions for John Brown, all of these things, uh, you know, they just speak to the ways in which there, there is very clearly that solidarity. Uh, you know, from the Haitian people in, in the Haitian state at the time, uh, projecting outwards uh, to the Black freedom struggle in the United States. Uh, and on that note, I, of course, too, like this sort of the subtext here, but, uh, you know, while there's very clear sort of self, uh, self-interest uh, for the, the Haitian leaders that promote uh, migration uh, to Haiti, uh, that this is a project uh, that also has a, a sort of liberatory bent, uh, because even you know the reality is that even as there is that self-interest, uh, that's also a project that was uh, uh, that was built on the promise and the and the deliverance too. That's the promise and deliverance of Haitian citizenship uh, to African Americans who were denied uh, citizenship uh, in the country of their birth. Uh, that you know promised them land in a place where they were the people enslaved on land, not landowners, right? Thank you, and thanks for mentioning Matt Clavin. I chaired that dissertation, so I'm really oh, okay. <laughs> so fantastic. really, really fantastic a good project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah really good project. So, good. so yeah. thank you for that. I just see we didn't organize this ahead of time, guys. <laughs> okay, so Brandon, I want to say thank you, but I'm going to hand this back to Eric to formally close us out. Everyone, thank you. Thank you, Brendan. Thank you, Laurent, Karen, as well as those of you in the audience. And apologies to those whose questions we couldn't get to. We had a lot of questions this afternoon. Uh, and please join us for the Washington History Seminar next week uh, on Monday, March 8th at 4 p.m., when we return to discuss Rosie Bashir's new book, Archive Wars, The Politics of History in Saudi Arabia. Till then, good night. Thank you, everyone, and take care.